Um, and thanks, Rima. Uh, my name is Yusra, and I work at InHive. Um, I'm also joined here by a wonderful panel who I'll be introducing later, and my colleague, Gemma. So I hope that many of you, if not all of you by now, know a bit about Enact Festival. Uh, we're in week three now, but essentially, um, this festival has been organized by InHive, and it's been running. It's, it's week three now, and we have still a few sessions lined up and still um, happening this week and next week. And Gemma will share some links later on for you to um, check out other events if you're interested. But essentially, this festival has uh, been all about um, talking about networks. It's been about sharing and collaborating and discourse around networks. And we really want to just get the conversation going around networks and the potential they have for social change, really. Um, and of course, we um, have not been alone on this journey. Um, it takes a village, as they say. Uh, and so we've been collaborating with a lot of other amazing folks. Um, you see some names listed here, but of course, we have a lot of um, support, um, you know, not all the names are here. Um, a lot of we've been put it, putting on some events with collaboration with some of these um, folks. So feel free to check any of these amazing people out later on. And one thing I just wanted to also highlight before um, I go through the slides quickly is that this festival is also sort of a celebration for our own network that we run. It's called Nexus. Um, it's a network for network practitioners. Um, and again, Gemma will be sharing um, links about that later if you're interested in checking it out. Um, it's free. Um, and I'd like to think that, it, I mean, we think it's wonderful and it's very helpful. Um, a bit more about that later. So specifically, when we think about networks, um, I mean, I mentioned we're doing this as a celebration and to sort of share more learnings in our network, but essentially the bigger question is why are we interested in networks and why are we doing this? Um, and for us, because InHive works with networks um, and organizations and schools and other institutions that also work with networks all over the world, we've learned to real we've realized over time, of course, that that any change or any challenge, any change that we want to make or any challenge that we want to sort of overcome can't happen, can't, can't happen if it's only one entity or one group working on it. So really the key and the answer lies in networks um, and collaboration, especially when we think about social change and social impact. Um, and specifically, we wanted this month to be a time for us to bring together folks from all sort of a lot of different backgrounds, from a lot of different um, work streams and interests and just to have a lot of conversations around networks so we can really think about how we can leverage networks for social change on a larger scale. So it's been a month of a lot of events. I'll go a bit deeper about the kind of events we offer. Um, and it's really in, it's really for anyone who's even remotely interested in networks, um, you know, and also obviously for practitioners and funders and, and, and really activists as well. We've had speakers, or we have speakers rather, from around 120 countries, including uh, 120. We have around 120 speakers, and you know, spanning across 30 countries. So it's really been um, an amazing experience for all of us in terms of learning and including a lot of different peripheral voices as well. Um, there's something for everyone. Um, we have network stories where network practitioners share on the ground stories. We have dialogue, which is more of a sort of a heated dinner table style dialogue uh, where we also encourage disagreements, you know. Uh, we also have live pitch practice between funders and fundies. Um, we have mini technique workshops, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's, you know, teaching a technique. Um, and then we have something called live problem solving, which is the session that we're holding today. Um, and I'll explain the, the structure just in a bit. Um, and we have, like I mentioned, we're trying to talk about a lot of different things when we think about networks. So we have a sort of a range of of topics and themes that we're focusing on. And of course, today's session brings together these amazing five people um, who you'll be hearing from later on. I won't go into introductions. We leave it to them to talk about themselves uh, when they sort of have the floor. Um, and today's session, I'm just gonna stop screen share. Perfect. And today's session um, is divided um, into two parts. Um, we'll, I'll hand over very soon um, to Marta, who will like, introduce herself, but then also talk a bit about specifically about the challenges that she as a network leader and network practitioner faces. Um, and then we will have a bit of a, a bit of a question and answer and back and forth um, between Marta and our three amazing consultants slash experts. We have Kennedy, we have Laura, we have Katie with us. Um, and then we we'll get time for them to give Marta feedback. Uh, I will also invite the audience, all of you, to share any suggestions, any feedback that you may have for Marta um, in chat. Um, and, you know, we'll give you the prompt so you'll know when to sort of share your thoughts. 
And then we'll do the same thing with Nicole. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end to just talk a bit about takeaways, any action items, and of course, any other sort of remaining comments or suggestions. Thank you for joining. I am now going to hand over to, um, sorry, to Nicole, actually, my bad. I mentioned Marta earlier. Um, Nicole is starting us off. Thank you so much. Nicole, over to you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited for this session because I, yeah, to, just to get the input from it. Um, my name is Nicole. I am the secretary for the Qatar Asmal um, Alumni Network. So it's a very young network. It was only formed in 2017. Um, and it's basically an alumni network of Qatar Asmal fellows who uh, were recipients of a fellowship program to study their masters in Ireland. Um, and it is a fully funded scholarship opportunity offered to South Africans. Um, and it's targeted at early career professionals in South Africa with leadership professionals, um, with leadership, um, with leadership uh, opportunities. Um, and the scholarship supports leadership in the sustainable development goals and supporting the development of women's leadership capacity. And also it focuses on participants from um, uh, previously disadvantaged universities. Um, and so after they complete their masters in Ireland, they, came, they come back to South Africa. However, after completing their masters, we, South Africa has a really um, poor economic uh, Currently, the, the climate in South Africa is very challenging. Youth unemployment is a massive issue. Um, and many of our members who come back do not find employment once they return. And so the Carter Asmal Alumni Network has been created to, in order to support our participants, um, our members, once they return to South Africa. What this means is that we have, um, it's, we're quite a young organization and we have a very diverse network of members um, who are based all around South Africa. In, this year, we will have our 100th member. Um, but really, uh, we want to, so, and some of our members are incredibly successful, um, and some of our members are not successful at all and are really struggling. And so we are trying to provide an opportunity to support both. Um, our main objectives for the Carter Asmal alumni is to connect members to career and entrepreneurial opportunities, to support them to find work, um, and another objective is to promote Ireland as a study destination for South Africans um, and to foster an engaged and supportive alumni network so that we are supporting each other so that those who are succeeding are able to support those who are still challenging. Um, so this specifically this speaks to the session um, because one of the challenges that we're finding is although we have a very small um, alumni membership program, it's, um, we really are struggling with engagement um, and, you know, we've got limited membership, so we know who the members are, but they're not really getting involved. So we hold regular networking sessions, um, but it will have like three or four people uh, who participants who actually join the event. So we're also very co cognizant of the fact that we want to support um, self-organization dynamics. So currently we have an executive committee where I am the secretary. Um, and we are bearing the brunt of organizing, uh, of, of kind of running this Qatar Asmal Alumni Network. And there's a lot of engagement. There's some engagement from members on the WhatsApp group, um, but we really do want to create a more, um, we want to really support the development of more um, self-organization dynamics. So specifically finding ways for members to organize networking events in their, um, where, around where they're based and also part of their interest groups. And so that it's not just the executive, um, or the uh, committee that's responsible for all events. Um, specifically, we want to make sure that the uh, alumni network is sustainable um, as it grows, because as we get more members, um, we want to do more stuff that supports them, but it cannot be um, on the responsibility of the executive committee. Um, we also want to create a community that supports its most vulnerable, while also recognizing the successful members, despite big differences in these locations and means of members. Um, and then another thing is just how do we improve our communication beyond a WhatsApp group um, and irregular emails? Um, so that is essentially um, our membership and engagement challenges um, for the Card Asmo alumni. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I'm now just going to invite um, our consultants to ask any questions, and I'll just pin them on the screen for everyone. Um, go ahead, over to you, um, 
Katie, Kennedy, Laura, this is your time. Yeah, Nicole, I have a just a question for you. Are all of the members of the network South African or do you have Irish members as well? They're all South African. Um, there are some Zimbabweans as well um, who now live in South Africa, but the majority of the, um, the members are South African, although there are opportunities to connect with further um, uh, members from around Africa as well. Um, a quick question as well for me. Um, uh, you mentioned that there's kind of quite a lot of diversity in terms of geographical, kind of where they're based in South Africa. Do you find that there are there some clusters or is it very, very diverse in that way? So there are some clusters and um, there is a cluster in Cape Town and there's a cluster in Joburg and those are the main um, members. Uh, so those are the, the biggest clusters. We also have a small cluster in KZN. Um, but other than that, they're actually quite uh, spread out. And so we do have chapters in each of these locations. We've got a very small Cape Town chapter, which is actually our most active one, one of the most more active ones. And then we have a Gauteng chapter as well, which is the most members, but is not quite as active or engaged. Great. And are most of the events in person or are they online? The networking kind of? Um, so thing. they have been virtual, obviously, over um, COVID, and it, which we found that it works for us. But at the same time, there is it, it does limit, um, virtual sessions do limit participation and engagement from members who don't um, who struggle with internet access. And we do provide data um, in some of these cases, but it's not always um, utilized by the members. I'm sorry, and we are trying to kind of create more in-person networking events now that we now that uh, South Africa is opening up, um, but we're always going to do a balance of sessions. All right, um, so Nicole, you mentioned that uh, there are a hundred of them. Um, is, so do they, when they are in Ireland, do they attend sort of uh, the same universities or different universities? And at what level of, uh, of education do they attend? So they attend different universities in Ireland. Um, so they're also spread all spread around the country. Um, and they all do, there's a number of master's programs that they can select on. So it could be agriculture, uh, human rights, etc. So there's just, it's a huge range, but it's always master's programs. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions or Nicole, is there anything else you wanted to maybe say that you didn't have time earlier? We have a few minutes, otherwise we can just transition to the next part. Um, nothing further from my side, I think. Perfect. Thanks everyone. Um, cool, then I would invite Nicole to turn off her video. Thank you. Um, I'll also unremove the spotlight. Perfect. So Laura, Katie, and Kennedy, feel free to sort of talk about Nicole as if she's not here, uh, specifically about her challenges. Um, thank you. Um, I'll share some initial thoughts. Um, I think what stood out for me was possibly the opportunity to um, maybe harness those clusters that exist and particularly kind of build on any kind of existing um, like um, the kind of the existing motivation that might exist in among some of those members um, maybe kind of bringing them in and trying to kind of nurture them as kind of weavers within those clusters and um, thinking about how they can then share that experience back with the wider um, the wider network as well. So that was kind of an initial thought for me. Um, I think I'm also, there's something I'm kind of reflecting on in relation to the network that we host at Ignite as well is really the, I think as, as, um, as Nicole shared, really the challenge of kind of online in terms of building trust and connection. So I think kind of where opportunities allow for now really kind of taking the opportunity to, to kind of facilitate and, and Kind of create those in-person spaces as well because I'm sure that would um, allow for that self-generation of ideas that Nicole's wanting as well. Um, so they were just a couple of initial thoughts that came to my mind. I, 
can jump in because I had I had this question around you know whether there are Irish members and I appreciated your question Kennedy as well around um, whether they've been to similar universities because there's something about networks about enough sameness and enough difference and um, I'm just wondering you know what these people have in common in this network is that they've received a scholarship from a funding organization um, but they haven't shared an experience necessarily uh, together in, in, you know, if they're being in different universities. And the thing that they have in common is that they've studied in Ireland. And so there was this question about how do we connect up the specificity of this group of people who've studied in Ireland and what they might want to continue that comes out of that specific experience, rather than focusing on issues that are perhaps connected to, you know, what they're, what they're facing now that they've gone back to South Africa, um, but that they could probably find in other networks, you know, if we're being open and honest about it, who, who are the best networks to support young professionals with finding um, opportunities, you know, is, is it because they've been to Ireland? So there's something about really connecting to the purpose and why people are part of this network in the first place and what it is that they might have to share and what it is about studying in Ireland that is a specific um, contribution to helping these young people um, find new opportunities as opposed to having studied you know anywhere else or have uh, you know a thematic connection for example or a professional connection or they've been to the same university or they've followed the same master's topic so what is it that really brings them together as a group and how that can be leveraged in the face of the issues that they're facing If I thanks, uh, just Laura. If I if I build on on that, I think the concept of um, you know purpose for the network is uh, one powerful way of rallying people um, you know behind something, and that helps to build certain connections. Um, and and then additional to that, um, maybe because of very little in common uh, between their family, except the fact that you know. They, they, were, they had a scholarship from, you know, Kadi Um if, if they can sort of define their purpose around something they can do, um, you know, for South Africa or, or for Ireland, um, that's one, one thing that can actually, you know, spur some participation uh, because it's sort of this, this goal. Um, the other thing that I think I also picked out um, with the number is 100 um, right now. I think it's um, quite a small network in port, um, but also presents a good opportunity to build community around that network. Um, and I just wonder at what point uh, do they start identifying with this alumni network? Do they start identifying after uh, they are done with their scholarship? or during the onboarding process to the scholarship. Uh, because if you have that connection, um, when somebody's joining the scholarship program, they are already connected to the alumni. Uh, that also brings that kind of, um, you know, a connection that becomes very important in terms of building community. And uh, yeah, so finally, I, I think just in terms of self-organization, um, there are several opportunities that you know these people can can have um, and can be encouraged. So one of it would be members uh, might, might want to have a certain initiative or they are running certain you know business or something, and it could be one of as part of community building to help uh, each other and support one another in whatever initiative each person has. So you'll find one person as an initiative and because they are passionate about that initiative and the others are invited to join, a sort of some self-organization starts happening at that level. Um, but I wouldn't be worried so much about self-organization um, for that small number um, of alumni, but I would, I would try to you know, start doing a little bit small, not too much of that self-organization. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I'm definitely kind of resonating with what you're describing around purpose that, that stood out to me as well. And I think maybe even um, allowing spaces for that purpose to understand maybe the like motivations and needs of the members a bit 
in 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 more detail and to allow that purpose to evolve maybe as the membership grows i think that could um also potentially kind of help um in terms of the engagement if, if there's if there's a sense that they're having a you know have have ownership over that purpose and have a stake in kind of defining what that is um i think kennedy your point around engagement from the beginning of the scholarship i think resonates a lot as well i could see how that could be um particularly kind of presumably when there's most um, excitement maybe around around the opportunity as well. I think that sounds really um, smart and strategic. Um, I also um, I should have maybe asked this as a clarifying question, but I was interested about the question around WhatsApp. And I, I actually think given the size, there's maybe a vibrancy and an informality to that as a modality that actually is maybe a strength rather than it being more formalized through email and other methods. So I wouldn't necessarily think that that needs to be changed but obviously I don't know the details behind that question um so like that was just another thought thanks Katie Kennedy and Laura sorry to jump in um and interrupt the flow uh but I'll have to move us on to Marta but before we do I wanted to invite um the audience if they wanted to share any thoughts or suggestions um or Nicole, or any even questions, which you know Nicole can take with her and think about later. Um, I know that I think I saw Justine raise her hand. Um, and so we'll just give a few seconds, maybe a minute, for people to type in chat. Um, and Justine, if you'd like to share your comment slash question in chat, um, it would be great. And then we can just get to it. OK, so should I, should I share in chat? Actually, go ahead. Go ahead. We have a few seconds. Please share out. Okay, I am part of the uh, Kader Asmal alumni um, with Nicole, and I was part of the executive before Nicole and the second executive team uh, took over. And I think uh, your thoughts are, are very valid, especially your thoughts about um, what we have in common having studying in, in Ireland. Um, I think we can draw on that a bit more. Um, and I also think that, that the WhatsApp is definitely a strength that we have because it keeps it informal and keeps us engaged. Um, but I also wanted to add that we do have some objectives for the group. And one of the objectives is career advancement and career development. So we do support each other with that. And it is an objective of the alumni group. We also have an outreach component, which hasn't really taken off because of COVID, but there is a component for us to do outreach together. And we also have a buddy system where we provide support to, to fellows that are st still studying in Ireland and they need some mentorship or some advice or some guidance or some tips or they're homesick and how to navigate living in Ireland. So that component is also part of the alumni group. So just to shed some light on that. Thank you. Thanks, Justine. That was really helpful. And, and it's, it's also helpful to know as we will come back um, as a main group and reflect on some of these things together. Uh, but for now, I'd like to invite Marta um, to share a bit more about her network. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Enact Festival team, for having me. Um, thank you, Nicole, for sharing your challenge and the coaches for expressing uh, your thoughts. Um, already a lot resonated with what I also um, bring here today. Uh, my name is Marta, and I'm a network coordinator at MITOST. Uh, MITOST is an association based in Berlin that is already 25 years old um, and uh, has been uh, continuously developing into a network. Um, so when the Mitchell started, it was an association that was implementing programs in the field of uh, active citizenship and cultural exchange. And then with the time, alumni of those programs started to create communities. Um, and uh, now we arrived at having actually quite a large network um, of um, alumni, but also friends, partners, institutions who started to join us uh, that are located in Europe and neighboring regions. So this is also our regional scope. 
Um, and at the moment, um, I think when it comes to the number of alumni, I do not have the exact number, but it's it can be counted in thousands. Uh, when it comes to our members, it's around 1,500 members um, who are the members of the association, therefore the network, um, and also over 40 institutions. Um, and what has been happening in Midost uh, for the past 25 years, um, gradually, of course, different activities um, have been implemented to bring the communities to together, we uh, were able to observe that the communities were very strong, the communities that gathered around the programs particularly, those people had a lot in common and they were able to self-organize, they were able to, um, to prepare activities for themselves. But then a challenge that we observed recently is that um, there aren't many connecting points between those communities. Um, therefore, we have a huge network that could definitely benefit from uh, learning together and being together, but we we um, struggle with bringing them together. Um, and what I wanted to bring here today um, is um, our festival. Mythos Festival is a, a celebration that happens every year. Uh, we actually will have our 20th festival this year in June in uh, less than a month time. And this is our flagship event to which the whole network is invited. And this uh, always happens in a different location, is co-hosted with a local partner. Um, and what we realized is that uh, even though we try to encourage um, participants of the festival to bring their inputs, so for example, part of the festival program is network-led. Uh, people bring their expertise, uh, they uh, organize workshops and sessions um, as they wanted. Um, we also organize a festival circle in which we invite the network to come, contribute, discuss topics of the festival, decide upon the festival programs. Um, and even though we have all of those mechanisms in place, uh, we realize that still a lot of the festival preparation is centrally led. Um, and I mean here communications, logistics, um, also small uh, funding support. Uh, so um, most of the work is still done centrally by the team in Berlin. Um, and because of the changed uh, funding structure, um, now we have to find a new formula because we can't really support financially the festival the way we were able to do so in the past uh, 20 uh, years. Um, and therefore, um, I was very much hoping to bring this topic here uh, to, uh, to the round to also hear uh, your opinion, your ideas on uh, this particular case, how members could be encouraged to self-organize and how this festival could be a network-led activity. Thank you. And I believe I'm on time, Yushra, am I? Yes, very well done. <laughs> Perfect. I'll just hand over then to um, Laura, Katie, and Kennedy for any questions. I, I have a question. Um, so Mata, with regards to how people join the network, how how do you recruit them? Because it feels from what you described, you really blessed with a lot of diversity, uh, which is a good thing. But how do they join the network? Thank you, Kennedy. So the main entry point uh, to the network so far were programs and uh, that people were uh, participating in, uh, led by Midost as an organization. I'm not sure is the noise on my end or is this. Um, on Kennedy's. Um, okay. Um, so uh, yeah, people were uh, participating in programs and then um, coming into the network naturally when graduating from the programs. Um, however, we also realized that because a lot of changes has happened, um, we need to find a new formula for the membership, which we are working on right now. Um, and we actually have the community membership concept, which is Everybody who feels connected to our purpose, uh, who maybe took part in the programs that Mythos uh, was running, or is a partner, is a friend, um, is somebody who simply would like to get involved, is invited to be our community member. Um, how we want to frame it, what also maybe is part of the struggle, is to make sure that uh, being a community member means being actively involved in shaping the network. Um, and uh, yeah, this is something that is definitely on our plates now to understand how to do. Okay, uh, thanks for that. And one more question uh, with regards to membership. Um, so you have the core members, we are a thousand plus. 
and, and then now you have these community members that you are inviting. Do they make any payment to join membership um, to be part of the Cornet? Okay. So, as I, as I mentioned, the, uh, the membership in this, uh, let's say, old format is still running because we are in the process of transforming this into a new concept. And yes, uh, the members who are official members of the association, which is around 1,500 people, they make a membership fee uh, payment every year. However, the community members are invited to join the community without having to sign up as um, an official association member, and they do not have to pay any fee. And our idea right now is to gradually shift uh, to have community members um, as just one big group and not asking to pay obligatory fees. Sorry, one, one final question for me. Um, it, am I right in thinking it's mostly individuals or have you got institutions also as members? If they're kind of balanced in that way. Mm -hmm. We do have institutions. We have over 40 institutions at the moment, and some of them are institutions who um, connected to our purpose and decided to join us. Uh, we do have this option of institutional membership that we are actually developing uh, right now to, to bring it to the next level. Um, but also a lot of our members, uh, with the time they created their own organizations or they joined organizations and they brought them uh, back to Mid-Ost. Um, so it's a mixed landscape, but yes, there are institutions and individuals at the moment. Katie, any follow-up? No, sorry. So sorry. one more. Sorry. Sure, Kennedy. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So, so this just with regards to the leadership of the core network, um, whether that, you know, the governance and decision-making happens at mid posts or um, it's member-led in the sense that members select their leaders who then make these decisions. I am not sure if I understand um, the question. So there is um, the governance of the network itself is connected to the association that it still is and it will be. Um, so members are invited to the governance model as well. Um, what the network team, which I am part of, is taking care of is rather um, implementing the strategy that is being developed by the council. Um, and making sure that um, there is enough of activities uh, that ideally would be member-led that um, feed into the strategy that we also um, want to implement. Um, so the strategy is something that is happening on the governance level um, that is consulted with the network team and then the network team is um, maybe more responsible for implementing the strategy and the activities. Thanks everyone for your questions and Marta for answering. I now invite you to turn off your video. I love to remove your spotlight and um, three of you can start your feedbacking. Thank you. Maybe I can start and, and just say that um, I think there's a question of just how much control um, it us would be willing to, you know, to seed uh, in terms of you know, decentralizing the network and making it more member-led. Uh, because then the more control you have, the more difficult it is to, 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 to have other people to, you know, carry the network uh, and self-organize themselves. But perhaps also if, if they are able to, you know, push much of the work that they do, for example, from the network team, um, the network members could actually know, take lead, and then the support from uh, mid sports becomes more um, like, you know, uh, secretarial support or, you know, organizing meetings and stuff like that, uh, taking notes and sharing them. Uh, that would inspire more people to keep participating because, you know, when people are more involved in at that level of decision making, uh, their participation is likely to, to improve. So. I think there's that question of how much control um, they are willing to let go, uh, and 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 you know for the other people to also take up. Um, yeah, that's one contribution I could make. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to jump in here. I guess there's something that stood out for me. I also know Nitas quite well, but um, about this link between, again, the sort of the purpose of the network and the community, why people are there and this idea around active citizenship, which was kind of the, the kind of core um, uh, starting point of, of Mitost and the challenge that they're facing today around um, needing to find a new formula and sort of shift their own organizing with the network and the community. And there's something for me about, is there, a, is there an opportunity to explore what that means in the context of a vision for active citizenship because a lot of the questions we're hearing here we also find in you know in new you know trying trying to ex renew democracy trying to um, engage in citizen participation trying to work out what the new funding mechanisms are to have multiple voices um, when there's obviously you know a lot of corporate uh, input, for example, and, and lobbying that's going on in the democratic realm. And so I wonder whether there's an opportunity here to really think about how, um, how to operate this shift from the vision for the wider whole around active citizenship, rather than just as an organizing or logistics question for the network. So that was my sort of first thinking around that. Um, yeah, I, I, I that that's, that's really interesting. I think but sort of linking to what both of you have described, I think what stuck out to me maybe was the um, the emphasis maybe on continuing the festival. And I suppose, um, I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm, we don't know all the background, but I would, I would be interested to know if there's been an interrogation really of um, whether that's even um, what the members want. You know, I, I, I'm wondering if there's, rather than asking the question of how do, how do we self-organize for the festival, really kind of asking more the question of is the festival the right model moving forward with all the other contextual factors changing? And is there maybe something else that speaks to what you were describing, Laura? Is there a different model, a different, different ways of organizing and different ways of, um, you know, share, sharing con and connection building that might actually Come, come more, maybe come from the membership and also come fit better with, I guess, the financial model moving forward, because that's probably a consideration as well. Um, and I suppose, again, not, not knowing if I've understood all the details from um, the summary that was given, but I, I wonder if the, there's an opportunity as well in, in what Kennedy was describing around um, thinking about kind of where control sits to really kind of, um, involve kind of involve kind of the membership more broadly beyond the council in, in thinking through that membership structure and costings and what, what that looks like, what a sustainable path looks like for, for the network. Thanks all. We have a couple of minutes left if there are any other thoughts that are coming to you. Yeah, sure. So I guess the other one I had is this question around, so it's my theme this morning by the sounds of things, but sameness and difference. And it sounds like there's a need for more difference actually here in the thinking rather than more sameness in that um, it's quite a large community. And in order to operate a transition, there will be multiple different roles that are needed. And um, there's something about identifying how people can be engaged, be actively involved, but from different roles, um, that being actively involved doesn't mean the same thing for everyone, that some people's form of participation might be more of a, a butterfly sort of format where they're kind of going around and then maybe sort of showing what they've seen and showing off a little bit or showing it to the outer world, taking it back to their organizations. Other people might be more in the pollinizer role where they're really kind of sharing learning internally between different communities. Um, you know, there are, there are lots of different roles that are needed in a community and there's something around the way you presented the, um, the challenge that talked about the community as if it was a sort of homogenous thing and like mem the numbers of members and what it means to really delve into what it means as an ecosystem and really understand what the different roles are. And the other thing I would say is that sometimes we identify those roles and then we sort of assign them to people long term, whereas our experience of working with communities is that actually it's not the same sort of organizing life cycles as within an organization. For example, people might not want to, you know, 
go on taking on more and more responsibility like you might in a sort of paid role. You might want to take on a lot of responsibility and then just be able to step back, right? So there's something about understanding the life cycles of involvement. Um, what it means to be actively involved might be very different from one year to the next, depending on what's going on in people's lives or where their focus is, and particularly in a world that's extremely adaptive and changing at the moment. So just some thoughts around that. Thanks, Laura. Um, thanks, Kennedy and Katie as well, um, as well as to Marta and Nicole. Um, if I could quickly invite Marta and Nicole back in the room. So Marta, if you don't mind turning on your video, I can spotlight you again. Um, you just have, I guess, one minute and a few seconds. I just wanted to, I think it's a really great note that you ended on, Laura, I guess, thinking about sameness and difference um, and the way Oops, I guess maybe we accidentally unspotlighted everyone as well. Jemma, could you spotlight everyone? Thank you. Um, I guess thinking about sameness and differences and how that plays out. So I guess I really enjoyed how with Nicole, we were thinking about how, what is the sort of the experience that really unites the community, the members beyond just, you know, having studied in Ireland and sort of what's that purpose. But I guess with Marta, we were thinking a lot more about sort of, you know, as Laura, as you were saying, the, the, the diversity and the differences um, and thinking about, the different roles and the participation um, that people will bring to it. And of course, leading back to the real purpose of sort of the network um, and then making that with membership models. Um, lots of stuff to think about. Marta and um, Nicole, if I could just maybe, I know we're just on time, but maybe if I could just invite a few seconds um, from you, just maybe something that resonated with you, um, highlights some takeaway that you'd like to share with the room. Um, so that could be the closing note from you all. Not sure if Nicole wants to go first, but maybe I'll just quickly jump for a few seconds. Uh, thank you very much for those insights and your thoughts. I would say that we uh, actually do spend a significant amount of time um, talking about the governance model and understanding um, all of those topics that you mentioned related to control, uh, to different levels of activity that people take on. So I am very grateful that you also saw this um, and you commented on this. I wonder if maybe I steered the conversation towards this uh, unconscious consciously um, as well, um, but uh, definitely an important topic and I take it away with me and uh, we'll work on it further. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, uh, Marta. Nicole, yes. Cool. Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of the points that we touched on were uh, super, I think, valuable and it's something that we also really are very much um, engaging with. Um, I really like the concept of are they same enough? Um, sameness versus difference. Um, really, I kind of just I think we've always worked in the you know we've had the shared experience. You know, there's a lot of sameness, um, but ultimately I think um, it does a lot does go down to the purpose of like why are we there? Why are we trying to help each other? And like are we all aligned um, with this purpose? Is is really important. Um, and then engagement from the beginning. I think that's something that we're also increasingly becoming to realize is really important that before they actually even start the fellowship program, getting involved um, from there and um, getting, yeah, so, so signing them on, onto the alumni program before they actually even leave the country. So um, that was very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and I also noticed uh, the comments in the, the chat group were also really helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole, for mentioning that. I was just going to thank our audience as well for sharing such insight, insightful comments and chats. Um, people are sharing their LinkedIn profiles in chat if anyone wants to sort of reach out and connect with folks. I want to quickly just say thanks to everyone. Um, thanks to Marta and Nicole for sort of, you know, sharing with us your network challenges for your honesty um, and for your bravery. I want to say and thanks to our consultants for sort of sharing their expertise and knowledge. Um, maybe I could just ask everyone to quickly unmute themselves, everyone in the room, and just do a human um, goodbye. We'd love to hear your voices. Um, yeah, just unmute yourself and just scream goodbye or have a great day. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks Bye. for joining. Bye.